Alrighty, so hi everyone. Thank you for attending today's presentation, The Adorable and Absurd History of Presidential Pets. My name is Nadia. I'm a librarian with the Adult Programming Department at the Woodbridge Public Library. If you have any library related questions or concerns, please direct them to me in the chat. I'm listed as WPL librarian. So all your cameras are gonna be turned off and your mics are gonna be muted to help with the sound quality and to help us stay focused on the presentation. But if you do have a question or comment during the presentation, feel free to drop them in the chat. We're gonna be doing a present um, a Q&A at the, at the end of the presentation. Um, and then also, if you feel comfortable coming off of mute, when we do go into the Q&A, feel free to come off of mute, ask your question, then just re-mute yourself. Uh, this program is a part of our annual summer reading club, Tales and Tales. Uh, for our club, you read whatever book you're interested in and you get entered into a weekly, a weekly raffle where you can win a prize. And then all of your entries are entered into a grand prize raffle at the end of the club. Uh, we have clubs for it. That, that's the details for the adult program, but we also have programs for teens and children as well, where they also get chances to win prizes just for reading any book they like. So please feel free to sign up online or in person at any of our locations. And to stay updated on our upcoming events like these, like this one tonight, um, check out our Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or our website, wilbridgelibrary.org. And now, enough for me. Please join me in welcoming our speaker tonight, Andrew Hager. Andrew is the his historian in residence at the Presidential Pet Museum. Hi, I, I'm so glad to be here tonight. Um, one of the one of the great things about um, I mean, there haven't been a lot of great things about the last year, but one of the good things about this virtual um, technology and these virtual meetings is that I get to appear to, to places, um, you know, like New Jersey, where I uh, otherwise would have to drive for several hours to get there, and, and this might not happen. So, I'm glad that I get to speak to you tonight. <clears throat> I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, myself and the history of the Presidential Pet Museum. And then we'll get into the, uh, to the dogs and cats and the other weird animals. Uh, my goal is to try and, ex try and answer some of the questions that I get regularly before we get to the Q&A. Um, but if you have a question, you can drop it in the Q&A, send it to Nadia and, um, you know, and we'll, we'll have a Q&A session in like 20, 20 to 25, maybe 30 minutes at the most. Uh, and she's gonna be kind of like guiding us around the website and going to different places. Um, so as she said, I'm Andrew Hager. Um, I'm the historian in residence at the Presidential Pet Museum. And the first question I always get is, is that a real place? And the answer is kind of. Um, right now we're entirely online. We're in the process of looking for a permanent home, a, a brick and mortar store, probably somewhere in the Baltimore slash Washington DC, greater metro area. Something that people could visit while they're uh, visiting the Smithsonian or uh, the Capitol or other places. We know we're probably not your first choice destination. You're not gonna you know, fly across the country to get to us, but we figure, hey, while you're checking out the Smithsonian, maybe you'll go a few blocks over to the Pet Museum so once we get a permanent location, that'll be great. Uh, but until then, uh, we're on presidentialpetmuseum.com. Now, the second question I get is, how did you become the historian at the Presidential Pet Museum? Like, what do you do to do that? And the answer is, I kind of backed into it. I was a middle school teacher for a number of years, uh, for about 10 years, actually. I taught social studies and English and I'm legally blind and sort of long story short, at a certain point, I guess my blindness kind of became an issue for the school system in which I was working. And I ended up retiring. And um, this presidential pet gig appeared to me. <laughs> a friend of mine knew a guy who was taking over the presidential pet museum. And she said, oh, would you like to, you know, talk about history and animals? And I said, of course. So here I am. Now, the Presidential Pet Museum itself was founded in 1999 by a woman named Claire McLean. Claire had been one of Ronald Reagan's dog groomers. Ronald Reagan had a bouvier named Lucky. Um, Najia, if you can scroll down to uh, Ronald Reagan and click on his dog, Lucky, um, we can see some pictures here. Uh, bouviers are, are fairly large dogs. They're probably in that like 75 to 100 pound range. And um, they're, they're black and furry, they get long hair. 
Uh, there's a great picture there of uh, Reagan is, I think he's sitting on the, in the seat in Marine, Marine One, which is the helicopter that the presidents use. And Lucky is considering himself a lap dog, even though Lucky weighs about 75 pounds. Um, so you see Lucky there uh, with Reagan. Uh, this lady, Claire McLean, was one of Lucky's groomers. She would go to the White House, and apparently, uh, to hear her tell it, there was like a shed on the side of the White House where they would take her and the dog. So she never interacted with Ronald or Nancy or any of the any of the Reagans or any chief of staff or anybody like that. It was just her and like the dog wrangler and some secret service in like a little shack. And, and you would almost think that there wouldn't be a shack on the White House premises, but that's how she describes it. So she would groom this dog and she started taking home the dog's hair. And she started using that in mixed media art. And eventually somebody said to her like, oh, you should open a museum uh, to show your art. And by this point, Claire, because of her interaction with the president's dog, had become interested in presidential pets. So she opened a museum out of her house in 1999, and it was great working out of her house until tour buses started showing up. Um, once they started having 50 or 60 people trying to come into her house at one time, uh, she moved it to a place uh, in Williamsburg called Pres President's Park in Williamsburg, Virginia. Uh, that no longer exists. So after that closed down, um, she's in her 80s now, and she started looking for a, a new home for the Presidential Pet Museum. And she found a guy named Bill Hellman, who's our current director. Um, he's a dog adventurer. He does a lot of stuff on YouTube under the name Woof Driver. Um, and so he got into this sort of because he loves animals and he loves history. And he brought me on. I've been doing this since 2017. And I thought I knew what the job was. I, I tell people like it was a very simple job during the Trump administration because President Trump didn't have any dogs. I would get the occasional phone call or email from a news source who would ask something, you know, and I would maybe do an interview. As soon as Joe Biden won the election in early November, um, you know, like I started getting calls like every day. It, it like became an entirely different dog. So or an entirely different job. Uh, now that there are dogs in the White House, or I guess at this point, just one dog in the White House. And if we can go back, um, maybe we can go to Joe Biden and we can click on Major because he's the uh, the current uh, dog in the White House. Um, <coughs> We're on Major. Okay, excuse me there. Yeah, at the, at the time that uh, President Biden was elected in November, he had two dogs, one of which was named Champ and the other was Major. Um, Champ was 13 years old. He had been um, he had been acquired by the Bidens shortly after the presidential election of 2008. I guess uh, my understanding is that was a concession that Dr. Jill Biden made with Joe, like, "Hey, if you uh, win this election, you can get a dog," um, and they won. So he got a German Shepherd. He uh, has apparently had many German Shepherds before, and that's his favorite breed. So they got a German Shepherd. Now Champ was from a breeder. What's interesting about Major is that in 2018 and early 2019, um, the Bidens fostered Major from the Del Delaware Humane Society. Uh, President Biden's daughter, uh, then he was just you know, former Vice President Biden, but his daughter uh, saw a picture on a website of some um, puppies, some German Shepherd puppies who had been exposed to toxic chemicals. And the Bidens agreed to foster one of the puppies and eventually adopted them, uh, d adopted him. And that, that became Major. Uh, this makes Major the first uh, shelter rescue dog in the White House. Uh, we can talk a little bit. We, uh, you know, I'll talk a little bit about Lyndon Johnson and Yuki. Yuki was a stray that was rescued and Johnson took in um, in the 60s. But what's interesting to me about this shelter idea with Major is that over the last 30 or 40 years or so, there's really been a push in the United States toward the idea of adopting dogs and cats rather than purchasing them from breeders. Uh, we're a lot more educated now about the idea of puppy mills, about, um, you know, just various problems in the breeding industries. Um, so the idea that Major was adopted from a shelter I think is really a sign of the times. And when people talk to me about the history of presidential pets, 
I try to point things like that out. Uh, if you go all the way back to George Washington, he had foxhounds. Um, you know, in the early days of the presidency, most of the dogs would have been working dogs, just like, um, you know, most of the animals that they had were working animals. They uh, almost every president or I would say every president up until, you know, the early 20th century had horses. They weren't really pets, although some of them loved specific horses like Ulysses S. Grant loved Cincinnatus. Uh, and he had a horse named Jeff, Jeff, Davis, Jeff Davis, uh, whom he really liked. Uh, you know, you find things like that, but generally speaking, the animals were primarily working animals in the early part of our history. As you get toward the beginning of the 20th century, you start to see a lot more, um, you start to see more of a modern view of animals. Uh, when you look at Teddy Roosevelt and all his animals, and we'll talk about him some, um, it's more, you get into that kind of pet idea. And now with Major being the first shelter dog in the White House, again, that's another cultural shift in American history. And we're seeing that uh, the presidents are responding to that. That's one of the cool things about having a democracy is that um, in, in a lot of ways, the, the people who lead our country are responsive to the changing cultural norms within our society. Uh, and Major's a representation of that. Um, now, I do want to go back a little bit. Uh, maybe we'll go back uh, to that White House Pets page and we'll go back to Lyndon Johnson and click on Yuki. Um, Yuki was a mixed breed dog who belonged to Lyndon Johnson. Um, the story of Yuki is that uh, I think it was Linda Bird, uh, his daughter, was coming home for Thanksgiving. They were having Thanksgiving in West Texas. Uh, not at the White House, but Johnson was president. It was 1966, and they were having Thanksgiving at his ranch in West Texas and uh, in Johnson City, I think is the name of the town where they live. And Linda Bird's driving, and she stops at a gas station, and there's just this dog roaming around there. And it's this white, fluffy dog, and, you know, it didn't appear to have a collar or anything. And she asked around like of the patrons that were there and of the owner of the gas station, does anybody know whose dog this is? Nobody knew whose dog that was. So she took the dog home to her father, the president on Thanksgiving. And she eventually gave Yuki to Johnson for his birthday the following year. Um, Johnson's an interesting guy because um, he was born in the early part of the 20th century in West Texas, very rural. Um, and he was his relationship with dogs was controversial. We'll get into that get into that in just a moment. But Yuki is you know if you read the way Johnson talked about Yuki, and if you listen to um, he he actually recorded an album called "Dogs Have Always Been My Friends," and you can find this on YouTube. If you listen to Lyndon Johnson talk about his history of life with dogs and his feelings about Yuki. It's obvious that this man just absolutely adored dogs. And Yuki was his favorite. Uh, I mean, he loved this dog. Yuki would sit in at cabinet meetings. Yuki would go with him everywhere. Um, you know, Yuki was just a much beloved dog. But Johnson is controversial because if we go back and we look at, um, if, uh, Najee, if you can go back and click on, I think it's him and her, Johnson's Beagles. Um, there's a very controversial photo that happened in 1964. A photographer from Life Magazine was there visiting the Johnson White House and they're taking pictures of Johnson with his dogs. And at some point they got a picture and I don't know if it's the one that's on the screen now, but they got a picture of Lyndon Johnson lifting his dog, him, up by the ears. Um, oh. And yeah, there it is. Um, so you, you see Johnson there, he's holding the dog by the ears and Nobody involved in this photo thought it was a big deal. Everybody thought this was just a normal thing. But when this photo was published in Life magazine in 1964, Johnson got hundreds of angry phone calls and telegrams and letters. And he had to issue a public apology for this. You know, people were saying things like, you have big ears. What if I pulled on your ears? How would you like that? Um, <laughs> but Johnson, being from rural West Texas, he really didn't understand what the problem was. Apparently, when you are going hunting and you're taking beagles hunting, this is one of the things that people do before a hunt. You kind of like lift the dog up by the ears and the dog will make some kind of bellowing sound. And that lets you know like, oh, the dog's in fine voice for the hunt today. 
Now, I'm not recommending that you lift your dogs up. If you have beagles, don't do this. Um, but because of this one picture, uh, you know, and this, this act that he did with him, his beagle, Johnson kind of has this reputation as being this guy who treated animals badly. And, um, you know, like, I really don't think that's the case. You know, um, like, obviously, I don't recommend you do this. And, you know, it, it was a poor choice. But given his age and where he came from and, and sort of the nature of his life, it's, it, you know, when you take all of that context in, it makes a lot more sense. And then when you take in, in the way he talks about Yuki, if you get a chance to listen to the YouTube clip of Dogs Have Always Been My Friends, and you can hear Johnson, at one point he and Yuki sing together, like he howls like, oh, and then the, you hear the dog in the background like, Arr! you know, they, they sing together. <laughs> you know, this guy loved dogs. He really did. And so it's, it's kind of unfortunate that this is the first thing that people think about when they think about Lyndon Johnson. Um, but Lyndon Johnson's a complicated president. You know, he did a lot to improve American society. And then he also got us into a quagmire in Southeast Asia with the Vietnam War. So, you know, just like with everything else with Lyndon Johnson, there's a lot of really good stuff. And then there's some stuff where you're like, ah, buddy, why'd you do that? <laughs> um, but uh, I want to go back a little bit farther. We're going to go back to John F. Kennedy because one of my favorite dogs um, belongs to John F. Kennedy. And um, that would be Pushinka. Pushinka. Push Pushinka was a small fluffy white dog. The story goes like this. Um, in June of 1961, John F. Kennedy and his wife uh, go to Vienna for a summit with the Soviet premier Nikita Khrushchev. And we've just had the Bay of Pigs invasion in Cuba. Kennedy is not looking good. He's not in a good negotiating or bargaining or even any kind of position with Khrushchev. Khrushchev looks like he knows what he's doing and Kennedy kind of looks like an idiot. So he's having a really bad summit with Premier Khrushchev. But at night, when the men are done talking, like they all go to a dinner together. And of course, you know, like with most formal dinners at that time, um, you know, you would see people kind of guy, girl, guy, girl, et cetera, et cetera. Khrushchev ends up sitting next to Jackie Kennedy. And he starts talking about Belka and Strelka. Belka and Strelka were two dogs that the Russians had sent into space. They had orbited the earth and they had been brought back alive. They were the first living creatures to orbit the earth. Strelka at this point had just had puppies and Khrushchev is telling Jackie Kennedy about how this space dog Strelka had just had puppies. Now this is probably kind of like a brag on his part. He's sort of like, hey, you guys haven't even sent a person into space yet. We've got these dogs. And one of them just had puppies. Well, Jackie Kennedy says, oh, you must send me one of those puppies. It was the kind of thing you say, like if you find out a friend has a beach house, you know, like, oh, you have a beach house? Well, you gotta bring me something. Oh yeah, I'll invite you sometime to my beach house. And then they never call you. Except Nikita Khrushchev actually did send Jackie Kennedy one of the puppies of the space dog Strelka. And that was Pushinka. Pushinka arrived at the White House in 1961 with a tiny Russian passport. Um, initially, the Secret Service and the FBI were a little concerned. They were like, okay, you got a gift from the Russian uh, premier. Um, maybe we should check this dog for listening devices and for explosive devices. And let's make sure that she doesn't have any chemical agents in her fur that will kill you. So they took Pushinka to Walter Reed Hospital and they examined her thoroughly brought her back to the White House, and she became part of the Kennedy family. She eventually had puppies with one of Kennedy's dogs, uh, a, a Scottish Terrier named Charlie. So I think of that as kind of a Cold War love story. The other part of this that I think is really fascinating is that when you get to the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962 in October, I've seen historians who have said that the back-channel exchange of gifts between Kennedy and Khrushchev um, helped them realize that they could back down from nuclear confrontation. And if you think about it, if somebody gives you a puppy, do you really want to drop a nuclear bomb on them? Like, can you really envision them as just sort of like the, ep the uh, you know, like icon of evil? No. So like, I think 
the fact that Kennedy and Khrushchev were able to kind of communicate through this back channel and that Khrushchev had sent Kennedy a dog. Um, Kennedy did send back a gift of his own. It was a ship and a bottle to Khrushchev, not nearly as cool a gift. Like that's, that's kind of lame, I'm sorry. Um, but the fact that they kind of had this relationship where they could give each other gifts and where they could talk um, sort of behind the scenes without their military advisors is probably part of the reason that we're all still alive today, that the earth is not just, you know, nuclear fallout and cockroaches. So um, Pushinka, I think, you know, kind of holds an underrated part of our history. Um, I, I find that idea so fascinating. Um, and of course, you know, like I said, she went on to have puppies. The puppies uh, were given to different, um, two, there were four puppies, two of them were given to family members or friends of the Kennedys, and two were given to children in the Midwest. It's possible that there are still descendants of Pushinka and Charlie, uh, and by that, for that matter, uh, Strelka the space dog, there could still be like descendants of them somewhere in the United States. So if you happen to know anything, please email me at historian at presidentialpetmuseum.com. I'd love to know if you have one of these space puppies, but you know, uh, odds are slim. Um, now, uh, we're going to go back a little bit. Um, Najee, if you could go back to that White House Pets page, and if you could click on the one, I think it's 1889 to 1953. It's the previous era. Uh, one of the questions I always get um, is, what are some of the weirdest presidential pets that people have had? So we're going to start by going to Calvin Coolidge. Um, Calvin Coolidge had a raccoon named Rebecca. Uh, so if you can find Calvin Coolidge and his raccoon. Now, I love the story of Rebecca almost as much as I love Pushinka. We, I won't say that we owe our existence to Rebecca, but this is just a really fun story. Um, Calvin Coolidge became president when Warren Harding died unexpectedly in 1923. Oh. Okay, I found him, I found him. We found him? Okay. Sorry, sorry. sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. And feel free to jump in anytime, Najia, if, if you have a question or if you think there's something I, like an audience member might have a question about that maybe I'm not oh, explaining yeah. clearly. Um, so uh, Coolidge becomes president in 1923 after Warren Harding dies. There are all these scandals about Warren Harding that start to come out, but Coolidge is really well liked. And one year, some supporter from Mississippi decided you know, I want to send the president a raccoon that he can eat for Thanksgiving dinner. So he sent this raccoon to the Coolidge's to eat for Thanksgiving dinner. Now, in those days, everything would have been done by train. Refrigeration wasn't what it is now. So you had to send a live raccoon. Um, you, couldn't send, you couldn't send a frozen one. It, it didn't work like that. And so the Coolidge's get this package, and it's an actual raccoon. And they were animal people. And they just couldn't do it. They couldn't kill this raccoon to eat for Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, by the way, I don't know if that's still a thing in any parts of the country. I don't know if like in Mississippi and the Delta or something, people eat raccoon. Maybe, I, you know, my family's always done turkey uh, and my vegan wife did tofurkey. Um, but, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the Coolidge's decided to keep this raccoon as a pet instead of eating it. And that Christmas, they bought Rebecca a, a collar with jewels on it that said White House Raccoon. And they built a little habitat for her outside of Calvin Coolidge's window. So while he was working in the Oval Office, he could look out and he could see his raccoon, Rebecca, playing there in the tree. And that's all well and good. Um, at some point, the Coolidge's decided like, oh, hey, maybe Rebecca would like a male raccoon, like they could date, you know, and that would be cool. Except that uh, once they got this male raccoon, whose name was Reuben, uh, Rebecca was not pleased. She started to run away, um, you know, and Secret Service agents would have to go out into Washington, D.C. and try to find Rebecca. Now, I've had people ask me, how does a Secret Service agent find the correct raccoon? I'm not entirely sure. I guess it's the one raccoon in a collar. But again, you know, like, my cats can take their collars off. I don't know why Rebecca couldn't. Um, Rebecca and Ruben, not big fans. Eventually, Rebecca ends up um, going, to, going to a zoo. 
supposedly after she had bitten Calvin Coolidge at, at some point. They had also tried to bring her to the White House Easter egg roll, um, but that didn't go well because she scratched some lady's stockings. And in those days, you know, stockings were much more expensive. And, and I don't know, do people even still wear stockings? I don't know. I think my mom still wears pantyhose. I'm not sure. Um, but it was the kind of thing like that was a big deal. Uh, so Rebecca got banned from the White House Easter egg roll. I'm sorry, Rebecca. Um, now, before we... Well, before we leave Calvin Coolidge, I, I do want to go to a non-exotic pet that Calvin Coolidge had, and that would be his dog, Rob Roy. And the reason I want to go to Calvin Coolidge's dog, Rob Roy, is because Grace Coolidge, the first lady, loved this dog so much that this dog is included in her formal portrait that hangs in the White House today. So um, if you scroll down a little farther, I think we can see uh, Grace Coolidge and her portrait. She's wearing a red dress. Yes, there it is. She's standing against this blue background and she has a white dog. So it's red, white, and blue. And this is like, honestly, I think this is probably the most beautiful portrait uh, of a president or first lady that I've ever seen. It's just really gorgeous. Uh, she looks stunning. The dog looks happy. And the fact that she included the dog, I think is a magnificent touch. Um, Coolidge was really associated with these white collies. He had Rob Roy. He also had another one named Prudence Prim. And, um, you know, he talked about that in his autobiography about how associated with collies he was. Um, they also seem to like this uh, kind of alliteration uh, naming scheme. So you had Rob Roy and Prudence Prim. They had Rebecca and Ruben. Um, he had some other dogs that also had these uh, same kind of alliterative names. Uh, you know, maybe that was just the Coolidge thing, but I, I just love this portrait. And I, um, you know, I, I think it's worth pointing out. This is the only portrait we have of a president or first lady with their presidential pet. Apparently this was Jackie Kennedy's favorite portrait uh, in the White House. And she hung it in a prominent position during the Kennedy's time there in the early sixties. Um, now, if we go back to Teddy Roosevelt, I, I, we do have to talk about Teddy before we can go on to anything else. And then I, I will take questions after that, because I know I've already talked for about a half an hour. And um, I'm sure that some of you wonderful folks have, um, have questions. But if we go to Teddy Roosevelt, um, I don't know if there will be great pictures for anyone specifically, but... Um, Let's see, I click on Sailor Boy. Um, Sailor Boy, I believe, was the, it was a Chesapeake Bay retriever. And Teddy Roosevelt, in his, um, in his journal or in a letter to someone, he wrote that Sailor Boy loved fireworks. Now, I don't know about you, but I have, uh, being legally blind, I have a black Labrador retriever that I travel with. And anytime there's any thunder or fireworks or anything, he like goes right into his crate and like lies down and, and whimpers. He hates it. Apparently, Sailor Boy liked it. And Teddy Roosevelt was one of these parents and pet owners who was very open-minded about what he would allow his children and his pets to do. Um, he didn't mind that his children were playing with explosives. He thought that was fine. Like, well, the children are into dangerous things. And boy, Sailor Boy, he just gets right in there and, and plays with them at the same time. Like, isn't that great? Um, <laughs> you know, it was the early 20th century and, and he was a, a different kind of guy. He really believed that the, that struggle was the most important part in life. And that, um, you know, like his views on masculinity today would possibly cross into, cross the border into toxic masculinity. Like, especially when you get into war and the idea of how he felt about that. But he was a really fascinating guy and he had overcome asthma as a kid by vigorous exercise and he loved animals. He considered himself a naturalist. One of the reasons why he was always hunting and killing animals was because he was collecting specimens. A lot of the specimens at the Smithsonian of, of different kinds of animals came from Teddy Roosevelt uh, on his hunts in Africa and other places um, because he thought of himself as a scientist and he loved to watch animals. Which brings me to Teddy Roosevelt's badger, Josiah. And I don't know that we have a picture of Josiah. I don't think there is one, but Teddy Roosevelt had a badger. Now, the story with this is that he's on a whistle stop campaign tour across the Western part of the country. Um, he stops in Kansas somewhere and a little girl shows up 
at this whistle stop tour with a badger in a basket. Now, right there, there are questions like, okay, where did the little girl get the badger? Why are the little girl's parents allowing her to carry the badger around in a basket? How did the Secret Service let her get to the president with a badger? And why would the president accept the badger as a gift? But uh, the, for the last one, at least, it connects to that whole idea of Teddy being a naturalist and a scientist and just loving animals. He wrote a letter home to one of his sons and said, like, oh, you know, I, I got a badger today and it bit me. How wonderful. Um, because that's the kind of guy Teddy Roosevelt was. I was bitten by a crazy animal. Isn't that great? Uh, most of us would be like, all right, this is where I'm putting the badger off the train, like go run free into the wilds of Kansas. But Teddy took it home. He built a habitat for the badger. Eventually the badger, Josiah, did, provo did uh, prove to be too destructive. And like Rebecca and Reuben, uh, the raccoons had to be uh, sent elsewhere to live because, you know, the White House, they have a lot of antique furniture and rugs and things that are really expensive. You can't really have a badger going around like clawing up some chair from 1793. It's just bad form. Um, so Teddy had to get rid of his badger. Now, um, I, I feel like I've talked quite a bit and I, I, uh, I hate to just ramble on. I could talk for another hour about presidential pets, but I, I wanna know, um, Nadia, do we have any questions in the chat yet? Um, did anybody ask anything? So far, everyone's been pretty shy or you've been very thorough. So oh. <laughs> we don't have a lot of questions yet, but if anybody feels comfortable coming off of mute to ask a question, you can. Oh, we just got one from Melody. Melody asks, is, where were any of the horse race, where, where were any of the horses race horses? Sorry about that. Um, I don't know that any of the horses were specifically racehorses, although some of them could go very fast. In fact, President Ulysses Grant got a speeding ticket once, um, you know, like riding through the city of Washington, D.C. in his horse-drawn carriage because he was having his horses go so fast. Now, I mean, um, in recent days, uh, you know, in, in recent times, I guess going back at least as far as Nixon, the Justice Department has a policy that like a, a sitting president can't be indicted. Uh, I don't know how that works with speeding tickets. I don't think they have to worry about that because usually they're in conjunction with the police and the Secret Service and they can speed wherever they want. But in those days, in the uh, early 1870s, a president could still get a speeding ticket. So um, it was a much simpler era. <laughs> um, you know, um, I'm trying to think, oh, uh, sometimes people ask me. Oh, we got about, a couple. Oh, go, go ahead. If you've got more. Yeah, let's do that. Karen says, who was the most recent presidential cat other than President Clinton's cat socks? President George W. Bush had a cat. Now there's, there's talk that President Biden might get a cat. Uh, last November, shortly after the election, there was a CBS um, Sunday morning episode where they announced that the Bidens were getting a cat, but so far no cat has been forthcoming. Um, now, President George W. Bush did have a cat. I believe its name was India or Willie. Um, the fact that it was called India most of the time actually sparked outrage in the nation of India. And there were some protests where people were burning effigies of President George W. Bush and Laura Bush because of their cat, India. Um, so, you know, it kind of goes to show that, you know, as, as sort of tangential and peripheral as presidential pets can be and arguably should be to history as a whole, there is some overall uh, impact out, even outside of the United States with presidential pets. Uh, but it's, it's interesting that you brought up uh, Sox because Sox was really kind of a superstar cat. Um, one of the things I would love to do if I could ever find a copy, apparently there was supposed to be a Super Nintendo game called Sox the Cat Rocks the Hill. And it was like socks, like going through Capitol Hill, trying to avoid different things like, I don't know, like maybe like a veto stamp is trying to hit him or something and he's trying to jump around it. Um, you know, I wish I could find like some kind of beta copy. It was never actually released. I've seen some YouTube videos of it. I don't know where those people found it, but uh, that's pretty fascinating. Um, 
Yeah. And, and Sox was also a stray, which was kind of cool too. Like Chelsea had found Sox uh, somewhere. The Clintons also had a dog named Buddy that they got later uh, around the time of the impeachment. Apparently Sox and Buddy did not get along whatsoever. Uh, I recently watched a, an old C-SPAN episode where they had the first lady's press secretaries talking and Hillary Clinton's press secretary was like, oh man, like a reporter asked me about Sox and Buddy. And right then they came into the room and Buddy was chasing Sox and Sox like swiped at him and he ran away and I couldn't control the story, you know? <laughs> so uh, sometimes that happens, but good for Sox for, for standing his ground. Um, you know, like I have dogs, but I, I'm more of a cat person. The, the problem is like being blind, like cats don't make for good guides. Mm -hmm. You know, like I can't harness a cat and be like, okay, go left. You know, the cat would just lay down and be like, whatever, buddy. <laughs> um, so but yeah, you know, I, I'm always glad when I see a cat that's not going to be intimidated by a dog. Um, do we have other questions? Um, Elky asks, uh, what was the first presidential pet? Okay, so there are a couple of ways to answer this. Um, the first pets in the White House would have come with John Adams because there was no White House with George Washington. So if you want to know about White House pets, John Adams had two dogs. We don't know very much about them. We know that their names were Juno and Satan. Oh. Now, if you can imagine a president today, like if Biden rolled up to the White House, he was like, this is my dog, Satan. Like <laughs> Tucker Carlson would be on the air like in 10 minutes, like with a 20 minute speech about like how Biden was a Satanist or something. And John Adams was only, he was less than a hundred years removed from the Salem witch trials, you know, like how are you, somebody who grew up like not far from where they were hanging people for witchcraft, going to name your dog Satan? I, I, I don't know how that worked. Uh, I, I like to think that he had a sick sense of humor. Um, you know, we sell a mug on our website that says like John Adams, his best friend was Satan. Um, you know, but uh, yeah, that was weird. But George Washington actually had a lot of dogs. And in some ways, um, George Washington's notable for his love of dogs because he, he liked to hunt foxes and he had foxhounds. He thought that the foxhounds that he had weren't up to snuff. Like he didn't think they were good enough. So his friend, the Marquis de Sade, uh, not Marquis de Sade, Marquis de Lafayette. God, that would be a very different uh, uh, Washington if he was hanging out with the sun. The Marquis de Lafayette sent Washington um, a bunch of French foxhounds who were more aggressive than the English foxhounds that Washington was used to. Uh, he sent them in the company of a young John Quincy Adams, who was in Paris at the time. And Quincy Adams brought them back on the boat and sort of left them in the wharf in New York. And Washington was sort of ticked off at John Quincy Adams, never really forgave him for abandoning the dogs there. But Washington did bring these dogs back to his home in Mount Vernon. He bred them to his uh, English foxhounds. And essentially, Washington uh, became the father of the American foxhound. He's recognized as such by the American Kennel Club. So he's the father of our country and the father of the American foxhound. It made the uh, foxhounds uh, faster and larger than the English version uh, were. And Washington apparently would visit his kennels every single day. Um, he loved his dogs. The downside of this, and this is sort of you know, when you start talking about the founders, the downside always kind of connects to slavery. Uh, Washington did not like his slaves to have dogs. He felt that his slaves' dogs were killing the sheep that were on the farm. And if he found dogs in his slave quarters, he would have the dogs hanged. Uh, so that's kind of distressing. Um, you know, also, he was very insistent that dogs be of a pure breed. If uh, one of his foxhounds um, bred with a dog of another breed, uh, like, let's say his coach dog, which um, he had a coach dog named Madame Moose, that would be a Dalmatian by today's standards. If one of his foxhounds had a puppy or had puppies with Madame Moose, he would drown those dogs because he didn't want to have impure or uh, non purebred dogs. Um, it was a very different time, you know, like we, that would be absolutely horrifying today. And of, of course, looking back on it, we can look at that and, and see that for the horror that it was, but in, to Washington, that was just like keeping the bloodlines of his animals pure because he wanted them to be able to do certain things while hunting and, and whatever. And he didn't want these dogs that he couldn't entirely control their pedigree. Um, so yeah, sorry, 
I know that's kind of a bummer. I hope we have a question that can allow me to get back to, uh, you yes. know, something else. Hey, you know, it's history. But, yeah, uh, that, that, that's true. <laughs> uh, we do have one from Pam. Did the majority of presidents have pets? Yes, there are only, it, it depends on your count, right? Uh, the majority certainly had pets. Uh, how many didn't have pets depends on the count. Obviously, Donald Trump did not have pets. When you go back past Trump, the first president you can come to where you would say maybe he didn't have pets was Chester Arthur. Uh, that would be in 1881. Um, Arthur had horses for sure, uh, but he also had a lot of his papers destroyed. So we don't really know about his private life, if he had any pets in the White House or if there were any horses that he was particularly fond of. Andrew Johnson did not officially have pets, but uh, during his impeachment trial, there were some mice living in the White House and he would leave out flour for the mice. He refused to allow his daughter to exterminate them. So I actually, you know, I think Andrew Johnson is possibly the worst president we've ever had. He's like this racist old drunk who totally screwed up everything Lincoln would have done. He never should have been president. And he should have been impeached. But I like I picture this old racist drunk sitting there and his only friends are these like little mice who come and eat this flower that he's leaving out for them. And it kind of makes me sad for Andrew Johnson just a little bit. Not a lot, just a little bit. But I like to consider those mice his pets. And then if you go back beyond him, the only other president where we would say like, didn't really have a pet would be James Polk. And of course, again, Polk had horses, but not he didn't love any of them the way that Grant loved Cincinnati or the way that um, you know Washington loved Traveler or anything like that. So you know you kind of get into this point where like well do you consider those horses a pet or you know they're they're really just kind of working animals. Um, but certainly in modern times, uh, President Trump is the only one who didn't have any presidential animals. And the only one who didn't have a dog going back to William McKinley in 1901. So, you know, that's kind of uh, how unusual that situation was. And, and President Trump addressed that at, at one point in 2019. He said, you know, like, I would just look phony if I got a dog now. And I think about that and I think like, well, for all the things you can criticize President Trump for, at least I feel like he was self-aware enough to know, like, I'm not a dog person. I shouldn't get a dog. And I, I feel like more people who are not dog people should realize that about themselves and not get the dog because that's how we end up with so many dogs in animal shelters. Mm -hmm. um, not that that would happen with a presidential pet, but you know, it's just the idea like you can't picture President Trump like in his $2,000 Armani suit, like rolling around on the floor with a Cocker Spaniel, you know, like that's just not who he is. So, um, you yeah. know, as much, you know, so, like, okay, good. Know yourself. That's, that's sort of the first rule. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway, it's, it's a very small number of people who have not had presidential pets. And by the way, all of the people I just named only one term. So I don't know if, uh, you know, I don't know if that's related at all, <laughs> but uh, one, no pet equals one term so far. An odd coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> Melody asks, did Roosevelt ever have uh, ever own a bear? I heard that's where the term teddy teddy bear comes from. Ah, he didn't own a bear. There is a story. Um, I, I might bungle this a little bit. The story is that there was a bear that he could have shot and refused to shoot on a hunt. I don't know. This is where the details get cloudy for me. I can't remember if it was a bear that was a mama and it had cubs, so he didn't shoot it, or if it was a bear that um, had somehow already been injured and he didn't feel like it was sporting to shoot the bear. But he refused to shoot this bear. And then in his honor, somebody making these stuffed toys decided to make stuffed bears and call them teddy bears, and they began to sell them. Um, now, the funny aside to this is that Teddy Roosevelt's uh, the person who followed him, his handpicked successor was William Howard Taft. And William Howard Taft, his supporters wanted to come up with an animal that they could sell. Like, well, we need a stuffed animal as well for Taft. And they came up with the idea of a Billy Possum. And they came up with this because one night at dinner, William Howard Taft ate an entire possum by himself. Now, um, there are a couple of problems with this. One is 
sparing the life of a bear for whatever reason seems noble and, and kind of like, you know, sympathetic. Eating an entire possum just seems gluttonous and, uh, you know, sort of wasteful. Um, also, maybe the teddy bears are a little cuter than the billy possums. You know, like I haven't seen like a billy possum that people were trying to sell, but it was a thing that people tried to sell. and They tried to come up with like songs that you could sing about your billy possum. It didn't catch on with the kids. So like uh, I have a 13 year old and a 10 year old. When they were small, they both had teddy bears. Neither of them had a billy possum. Um, now, uh, just to get to the bear question for just a second, Thomas Jefferson did have a grizzly bear that he kept in a cage on the lawn of the White House during his presidency. Uh, this would have been during the time of Lewis and Clark. People were going out and exploring other parts of the, the country that had previously been unknown to those of European descent. And they sent back a grizzly bear cub. But as the bear cub got older, it became obvious, like, uh, you know, grizzlies are what, like, 15 feet tall when they stand on their hind legs. Like, we can't keep this here. It's going to eat somebody. So they sent it away. Like, they, um, I, I'm not entirely sure where they sent it because there wasn't a zoo at the time, but maybe they just released it into the wild somewhere in Maryland or Virginia. But uh, they decided not to keep it on the White House grounds at that point. And for now, that's all the questions I have. If anybody has any other questions, Read yeah. um, sometimes people ask me about cats, like who was the first cat? Um, the first presidential cat uh, belonged to Abraham Lincoln. Um, he loved his cats, apparently. Um, Lincoln's dog, Fido, is also the first presidential pet to ever be photographed. Lincoln had a dog. It was a mixed breed dog. And at that time um, in the West of the United States, and Illinois would have been the West at that time, Owning a dog was kind of like a middle class bordering on upper class pretension. Like poor people didn't own dogs. You know, dogs were just something that roamed around in your neighborhood. Uh, Lincoln became a lawyer and as he started to become wealthier, they got a dog. And they had this dog named Fido, which is Latin for faithful. And the problem with Fido was that he was really kind of anxious. Uh, some of you might have anxious dogs at home. I know one of my dogs is anxious. Uh, and so when lots of people were coming around to celebrate Lincoln being elected, the dog wasn't doing well, and they realized we can't take this dog with us. So they, they left Fido with some friends in Springfield, Illinois, under the, um, you know, they, they gave him a set of rules like Fido must be allowed to come and go as he pleases. And if he wants to be on the furniture, you have to let him on the furniture and all of this. And they, they took pictures of Fido at, at a local uh, photographer's uh, business so they could have them to remember Fido while they were in DC. The idea was that they would get Fido when they came back. Of course, we know that Lincoln was assassinated uh, about a month into his second term. So he never came back uh, in his living form. Although uh, when he was brought back in his coffin and they did the funeral procession, Fido was part of the funeral procession for Lincoln. Uh, the unfortunate thing about Fido is that that whole rule about allowing him to come and go as he pleases turned out to be bad because a couple of years later, Fido was out and there was uh, uh, one of the local drunks was sitting around somewhere in the town and Fido jumped up on him and got the, the drunk muddy and the drunk stabbed Fido to death. Uh, so Fido, like Abraham Lincoln, uh, was assassinated. Um, now, Lincoln with cats, he did have cats in the White House. He liked them. He would actually feed them from the table. Like the cat would sit in his lap and he would feed the, the cat. And Mary Todd said to Abraham Lincoln, you know, look, uh, should you really be feeding him from the White House plates? And Lincoln said, um, you know, these plates were good enough for James Buchanan, so they're good enough for this cat, which is some really great political shade to throw on your predecessor. James Buchanan uh, being right up there with Andrew Johnson, uh, or I guess down there with Andrew Johnson at the very bottom of presidential uh, uh, terms, as at least as far as historians are regarded. I think it's Johnson and Buchanan who tend to always fight for absolute worst, uh, even in the most recent uh, ranking that came out a month or so ago. I think Buchanan turned out, historians voted him the worst. So yeah, like Lincoln's cat probably would have been a better president than James Buchanan. Although Buchanan had a Newfoundland dog, possibly the largest pet ever in the White House, 170 pounds, named Mara. And he also had a teacup dog, um, 
you know, who was small enough to fit under a cup. So that would have been a really odd pair at the White House. If only um, more people had been able to photograph things around that time, that would be really great. But alas. And uh, we got another question. Melody asks, is, did any president have a fish or aquarium? Hmm. That's a good question. And one of the issues with this particular question is that if you go back far enough, like into the 1800s, um, you lose a lot of the, you know, like we don't have the same knowledge. Like we didn't have a 24 hour media cycle. Um, reporters didn't have the same kind of access and this wouldn't have been as important. So if there were presidents who had fish at that time, uh, we wouldn't know. To my knowledge, nobody has really had pet fish in the White House. We've had a couple of pet birds. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt's kids had some snakes. Um, they also had flying squirrels, uh, but we didn't really have fish. Now, during the Trump administration, when people would ask me, like, what kind of pet should President Trump get if he gets one? I always said fish because, like, you know, he's a guy who owns hotels. And you can, you know, you've probably been in a hotel or like a fancy restaurant where they just have like a really beautiful fish tank with all of these saltwater fish who are really colorful. And like, I know that President Trump wasn't into germs, like he was kind of a germ phobe. So like fish are something you don't have to touch. It's not going to lick you. It's not going to slobber on you or shed on you. You know, it always seemed like a good answer. You know, I would tell people Trump should get a fish, but he never, uh, never took me up on that. I, I, he probably never read any of my interviews, un unfortunately. Um, <laughs> I wasn't on Fox and Friends, so he didn't see me. Um, <laughs> you know, but if, he's, if you're here tonight, uh, Donald, get some fish. <laughs> Oh, but yes, that's so far. That's my last question. Um, All right. Well, we're we're kind of coming up on eight o'clock now too. So uh, it's sort of a last chance. If you if you've got a last minute question, you can send it in the chat, or you can hit the space bar and come off mute and just introduce yourself and ask something. Well, I feel like we we've learned a lot, and the website also is a great resource because as I'm scrolling, like. I mean, if you had any particular president that you were really interested in, this is pretty thorough. It's like a database of of, of all the pets. So, Bill yeah, and there, the, there's a lot we haven't covered. Um, and I, I would also point out, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that I'm currently writing a book for Harper Collins that will be published next July called All American Dogs, A History of Presidents and Their Pets. Um, so, you know, if you want to learn more, and if, if the library would like to have me come back in July of next year or August of next year to talk about my book, I'd be happy to do that. Um, I see we're getting some chat questions here. Do we have, a, do we have questions in the chat, Najia? Most of these are comments. Uh, Tammy says, this was wonderful, thank you. Marley says, thank you. Pam says, great program, thanks. So a lot of just admiration. Well, that's that's thank great. <laughs> but I, I, I feel so grateful. Um, to you, Najia, for reaching out and inviting me to come do this because, um, you know, I just love talking to people. Like I see this almost as like a backdoor to history. Like you get people interested in the pets and then suddenly you're like, oh, well, Calvin Coolidge, he had raccoons. Like what kind of person was he? And then you read more and it's great. It's great. It's like a, the fulfillment of everything I wanted to do when I was a middle school social studies teacher. So I'm so glad that you guys had me here tonight. Thank you all for coming. No, we thank you so much, you know, getting into the wrapping up, but like, thank you so much for, you know, taking the time to speak with us, you know, life is busy. So we are very <laughs> grateful for you to spend like an hour with us and, you know, go through each of the pets with us. So we are very grateful at the Woodbridge Public Library and we're thankful for everyone who came out tonight or stayed in tonight and logged in. <laughs> We're really, you know, we appreciate anybody who participates in our program. So thank you so, so much to everybody for doing this tonight. Thank and you, everyone. On that note, I think we're going to wrap it up for tonight. And like I said, if you want to find out more information about programs that we're offering, like this one, just check our website, our Facebook, our Twitter, our Instagram. We are continuing to have all a bunch of animal based programs for the rest of the summer. We're also going to be doing some hybrid programming in August. So we're going to have some speakers come in. If you're still uncomfortable, you know, coming in person, totally understandable. We're still going to be streaming over Zoom as well. So just keep a watch on that and look at our um, calendar for more information. I have a very thorough uh, write up on what we're doing, 
how you can log in and everything on each of the program's little tabs. But thank you again, everybody, for coming out tonight and have a good day. <laughs> Bye.